Well, welcome to Ardenwood's 2018 annual meeting. We're delighted that you're all here. Thank you for joining us also on Zoom um, live stream, something we're trying first this year. So we're excited about that. We're delighted to have you all as our guests today and hope that you've enjoyed these beautiful pictures and videos. Um, you'll see a little bit more in our meeting, but it's kind of fun to see an overview. Very briefly, let me cover some housekeeping items. First, I'm John Mitchell. I serve as exec executive director and CEO here at Ardenwood. Please turn off all cell phones, if you would, or switch them to vibrate. Bathrooms. Bathrooms are located in the back of the Bible Research Library here on your left or beyond the um, front desk on your right. Exits are located in the back of the auditorium and also through this door here. Those are where exits are. Also, we have some job openings. We have a human resources generalist, development assistant, and front desk receptionist reservationist. Please visit our website, ardenwood.org, for more details. Um, we have an excellent team to be a part of, and we'd like you to join us. So please check out our website. And as always, there'll be a lovely reception following the meeting in the great room. And there's also be a tour during that time that I will give. Hope some of you were able to come and go on the earlier tours that we had earlier this afternoon. And then there are a few important thank yous I'd like to mention. To all those who made today run so smoothly, thank you. It truly is a team effort, as you know. To our board of trustees for their generous commitment of prayers, ideas, time, financial support, but most of all for their leadership and love through thick and thin. We've experienced both. Thick is preferred. Uh, <laughs> last but not least, to our former board president, Wiley Gregg, who is with us here today. He served and led with tremendous wisdom, humility, grace, and patience, which, we have, which have been invaluable to Ardenwood and to me. Thank you, Wiley. Please join me now in a round of applause. And now let's officially begin our meeting with readings given by trustee Nancy Gunnison. Nancy. I'm going to start reading from the Bible, Matthew. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. First Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock 
that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Psalms. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. And from the writings of Mary Baker Eddy, first, Science and Health. Spiritually interpreted, rocks and mountains stand for solid and grand ideas. Jesus established his church and maintained his mission on a spiritual foundation of Christ healing. He appealed to his students, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? That is, who or what is it that is thus identified with casting out evils and healing the sick? Yearning to be understood, the master repeated, but whom say ye that I am? This renewed inquiry meant, who or what is it that is able to do the work so mysterious to the popular mind? With his usual impetuosity, Simon replied for his brethren, and his reply set forth a great fact. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is, the Messiah is what thou hast declared, Christ, the Spirit of God, of truth, life, and love, which heals mentally. This assertion elicited from Jesus the benediction, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. That is, love hath shown thee the way of life. Before this, the impetuous disciple had been called only by his common names, Simon bar Jonah, the son of Jonah. But now the master gave him a spiritual name in these words, and I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, the meaning of the Greek word Petros, or stone, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, Hades, the underworld or the grave, shall not prevail against it. In other words, Jesus purposed founding his society not on the personal Peter as immortal, but on the God power which lay behind Peter's confession of the true Messiah. Rock, spiritual foundation, truth. and from miscellaneous writings. These two words in scripture suggest the sweetest similes to be found in any language, rock and feathers. Upon this rock, I will build my church. He shall cover thee with his feathers. How blessed it is to think of you as beneath the shadow of a great rock in a weary land, safe in his strength, building on his foundation, and covered from the devourer 
by divine protection and affection. Always bear in mind that his presence, power, and peace meet all human needs and reflect all bliss. Built on the rock, our church will stand the storms of ages. Though the material superstructure should crumble into dust, the fittest would survive. The spiritual idea would live, a perpetual type of the divine principle it reflects. And from unity of good, God is not the shifting vein on the spire, but the cornerstone of living rock firmer than everlasting hills. Let's sing. Let's sing um, the hymn by our leader, Christ My Refuge, from the new, the gray hymnal supplement. Um, Number 550. Sorry. <laughs> or waiting harp strings of the mind, there sweeps a strain, low, sad, and sweet whose measures bind the power of pain and wake a white-winged angel throng of thoughts illumined by faith and breathed in raptured song with love perfumed. Then his unveiled sweet mercies show life's burdens light. I kiss the cross and wake to know a world more bright. And o'er earth's troubled, angry sea, I see Christ walk and come to me and tenderly, divinely talk. Thus truth engrounds me on the rock upon life's shore, against which the winds and waves can shock, oh, nevermore. From tired joy and grief afar and nearer thee, Father, where thine own children are, I love to be. My prayer, some daily good to do to thine for thee, an offering pure of love, whereto God leadeth me. Hymn number 550.
Good afternoon. I'm Leslie DeFrisco, Director of Christian Science Nursing Services. When I think of the purpose and mission of Arden Wood, I see clear parallels to our church. Not just because this magnificent building is built on bedrock, but because our mission is allied to Jesus' mission of spiritual healing and renewal. This structure of truth and love is a refuge from the storm, a safe haven set apart from materialism. It's a place where those seeking healing can come and feel God's loving embrace with the support of Christian science nurses standing with them firmly on the rock. Ardenwood lifts you away from concerns of responsibilities of home and distractions, as well as anxious thoughts of family and neighbors. It's a true healing sanctuary. Mary Baker Eddy says it beautifully in a letter to a branch church. Thus founded upon the rock of Christ, when storm and tempest beat against this sure foundation, you, safely sheltered, in the strong tower of hope, faith, and love are God's nestlings, and he will hide you in his feathers till the storm has passed. Into his haven of soul there enters no element of earth to cast out angels, to silence the right intuition which guides you safely home. Christian Science Nursing always has been and always will be an essential part of our mission at Arden Wood. <clears throat> now I'd like to introduce you to the rest of the panel. Aisha Langell is our Assistant Director of the Visiting Christian Science Nurse Service. And Vanessa Campbell is a mentor and instructor in the Christian Science Nursing Arts Training Program we're going to ask a answer a few frequently asked questions. Vanessa? Yes? What makes, <laughs> what makes Christian Science nurses different from other caregivers? What percentage of their time is spent in spiritual support versus caregiving? Well, what sets the Christian Science nurse apart is an active spiritual witnessing going on 100% of the time. The Christian science practitioner is providing Christian science prayerful treatment for the patient. And the Christian science nurse is expectant of healing while ministering to, let's say, needs of nourishment or cleansing and bandaging, for example. Right there in the midst of a challenging situation, they are beholding the perfect man while meeting the human need. Our leaders bylaw Christian Science Nurse, which I know many of you are quite familiar with, is complete. It includes the spiritual and the practical as one. And the wholeness of that bylaw is a standard and a beacon to the Christian Science Nurse in his or her daily work. Also, on page 395 of Science and Health, in the chapter Christian Science Practice, we read about qualities that are required for the nurse. 
Mrs. Eddy names a few qualities that are not desirable in the, the healing surroundings of a patient, being ill-tempered, complaining, or deceitful. And, and then she goes on to say the nurse should be cheerful, orderly, punctual, patient, full of faith, and receptive to truth and love. So you see, the skillfulness of a Christian science nurse that they express, it really springs from a deep and abiding love for God and his spiritual creation. It truly is a calling and a healing ministry. Leslie, <clears throat> Leslie when should someone call a Christian science nurse? When they first think they could need some help before they're discouraged or overwhelmed or even feeling like giving up. If you think the challenge may be too big or too small, that's exactly the time you should call. Just call and ask if this might be something that a Christian science nurse could help with. Christian science nursing should not be considered a last resort. It should be our first response. What happens when patients come to Arden Wood? They live, they're healed, they grow spiritually, they feel God's ever-present care. And during that time, they are beautifully cared with, cared for. Aisha, can you tell us a little about the visiting Christian Science Nurse Service? Yes, I would love to. <clears throat> Home is a diverse spot on earth, and we are here to help you stay in your home by providing preventive care and by making sure you are safe and cared for properly. We make assessment visits to help you see the best way to take care of your loved one or yourself. And we, we are happy to make follow-up visits if needed. We have scheduled visits every day, but we need to stay flexible to respond to emergency calls when help is needed right away. God is already there, even before we arrive. Leslie, isn't it expensive to come to Arden Wood? It's not as expensive as you might think. Take Medicare, for example. Many people don't realize that they can use that benefit here at Arden Wood. And also, there are many health insurance policies that will also cover care here. We're also very grateful for a new fund started last year, the National Fund for Christian Science Nursing which has been very generous in assisting patients receiving care both at Ardenwood as well as at home. It's very easy to access and very generous. The message we want to share is that concern about the cost of care should never be, should never enter in to your receiving that care. We'd be happy to talk with you. All you need to do is pick up the phone and call and we'll help you to figure it all out. Here is the last question. Vanessa, do we see much healing? Yes, yes we do. <laughs> In fact, we'd like to share two recent testimonies of healing with you all right now. I'll begin with the first testimony. They were angels, really. I like to think of the Christian science nurses who cared for me at Arden Wood for a six week period, as well as the visiting Christian science nurse who came to our home as angels of the highest order, straight from God. A painful mobility challenge, as well as the inability to use my arms and hands were getting in the way of an active life a full-time job that includes travel, a husband and a young daughter, Sunday school students, 
and the upcoming holidays, meaning gifts to bake and purchase, special school events, hosting family gatherings. I resisted my husband's suggestion that I go to Arden Wood to focus on healing. I had too many responsibilities and things I needed to do. One Sunday morning, while my husband was on an errand before church, I lost consciousness and fell. Our daughter came to my aid and phoned my husband, who in turn phoned a visiting Christian science nurse. She was heading to church, but immediately came to our home. The love and peace that filled the room when she walked in was like none I had ever experienced. She proceeded to carefully and patiently clean and tend to the wound on my head. Hers was indeed the Christ-like touch referred to in A.E. Hamilton's poem. Ask God to give thee skill in comfort's art, that thou mayest consecrated be and set apart unto a life of sympathy. For heavy is the weight of ill in every heart, and comforters are needed much of Christ-like touch. She also communicated with the Christian Science practitioner, who had already been providing me Christian Science treatment through prayer. Again, my husband suggested that I go to Arden Wood to comfort and assure my family of my well-being while they were at work and school. Again, I resisted until I fell the next morning. Two Christian Science nurses came to our home and brought me to Arden Wood. I was instantly and completely embraced in an unspeakable sense of comfort and love. And I was utterly free to be still and to learn more about my indestructible relationship with our Father Mother God, who I knew in my heart would never let me down. The next morning, a Christian science nurse came into the room and exclaimed with exuberant joy, there will be three people cherishing you today, and I get to be one of them. I was surrounded by angels straight from God, whose joy it was to cherish and hold me in thought as God does. Arden Wood was just the place and atmosphere I needed to break the mesmerism. The Christian Science nurses assisted with daily needs, bathing, dressing, providing meals, and making sure I was comfortable for the night. They moved the furniture in the room so that I was increasingly able to become more mobile. Sometimes they would pray with me and we would share metaphysical ideas, articles, and hymns. One dear Christian science nurse accompanied me on late night walking tours of the building and practice sessions walking up and down the stairs. Basically, they were the key to providing a supportive, quiet, and unencumbered space for me to listen and pray. One morning, the Christian Science Nursing Supervisor came into the room and saw me crying as I struggled with the simple task of putting on my socks. In a moment of inspired wisdom, she brought her face close to mine and told me to look into her eyes and hear the words of her mother. I knew I'd better listen. One thing I remember she said, that she did not want to come in and see tears from me again, unless they were tears of rejoicing in healing. In that moment, my thought turned, and I was ready to move forward. This gift of time and stillness afforded me the opportunity to explore more deeply my relationship with God. I learned to cherish the cloud of witnesses who have come before me, as well as those who are present today. And I grew to understand a little more of my responsibility in carrying forward this legacy of faith, hope, and healing in running with patience the race that is set before us. The head wound healed swiftly and beautifully, and the bruises disappeared without notice. 
After several weeks and a few trial overnight visits at my home, it became clear that I was ready to safely return home, tend to my family, and re-engage professionally, all with a renewed and growing understanding that God is at the helm. There were still challenges along the road to complete freedom, but what I learned during my time at Arden Wood bolstered my resolve to stay the course and eventually claim victory. Step by forward step, I was able to resume my normal activities with a renewed sense of purpose and dedication to Christian science. My heart is full of gratitude for the faithful Christian science nurses and practitioners who dedicate their lives to the healing practice of Christian science and for Christian science nursing facilities that provide a haven in times of need. And another testimony. One of the most important lessons I learned from going to Arden Wood for Christian Science Nursing Care is not to be like the man at the Pool of Bethesda who waited 37 years for healing. I learned not to wait for healing to come to me, but instead to search for it through diligent study and prayer and to expect to be healed. I also learned to listen to the Christian Science nurses who were helping me by sharing inspired ideas resulting from their prayers. When they sang a hymn, I joined in. One day, the only way I was able to get to the bathroom was to sing with my Christian Science nurse, I walk with love along the way. I realized how important it is to look for anything good and to thank God for it to rejoice evermore. Several things contributed to my healing. Having the time to spend the morning working with the pastor, doing the lesson really well, and then doing some hardcore directed study was invaluable. After lunch, I would go outside for a walk, which was my way of putting prayer into practice since immobility was the reason I was at Arden Wood. I also realized how helpful it is to get out of our routines, out of my room or my house, to gain a different, fresh perspective. When I arrived at Arden Wood, I needed help just to stand and sit. When I went home after a week at Arden Wood, my healing wasn't yet complete, but continued steadily. I felt ready to go home when I could dress and care for myself and get around more easily on my own. I was so grateful for the progress. Ardenwood is here for us to use. It's a place for healing and a place to get back to living a full life. Don't wait to go there and take advantage of everything Ardenwood has to offer. There are many more healings we could share if we had the time. However, that's all for now. I just want to let you know that um, before you leave, by the exit doors, both the elevator to the back parking lot and the front door, you will find some information available on the table. There's information about our Christian Science Nursing Services and other programs, including phone numbers. It might be a good idea to take some of those phone numbers and enter them into your cell phone, whether Arden Wood's number or the visiting Christian Science Nurse number, and then you'll have them should you ever need them. Thank you. It is so good to be here, isn't it? I'm Diane Spear, and I'm the director of the um, residential programs here at Arden Wood. And I ask one question, 
Why do individuals come from all over to become residents here? Well, there's lots of reasons, but two have stood out over the years and I thought I'd share those with you. One prominent reason is to be near family. So what does that mean? For some, it may mean that your family is right here in San Francisco or somewhere in the Bay Area or California or somewhere on the West Coast even, or like me on the other side of the continent and then one on the next continent over. But wherever they are, they're, right, they're able to come here so easily with a beautiful international airport right here, San Francisco Airport. So they are near. And once they're here, there's plenty of space, plenty of overnight beds for them to stay in while they visit, plenty of places at the table, no preparation on my part to get them ready. And so it's just lovely to have family near. Um, Ardenwood is a great place for all families. And those families are so happy knowing that, eat, that their loved um, family members are living such a full life here, which leads me to reason number two that is very prominent. And that is the desire to grow as a Christian scientist. Over all its almost 90 years, everything at Ardenwood has been developed and has continued in its purpose of supporting Christian science growth. So at Arden Wood, one can daily prove and improve one's understanding of God's God and his wonderful creation. So residents that are here right now are among those that know that now is the time to soar and sing. So we hope many of you think of that when you watch the video, which is coming up. It's called A Day in the Life of a Resident, and I hope you enjoy it.
Thank you so much, Edie, and for all of the residents that participated in that example of a day in the life of a resident here at Arden Wood. Know this, that no two are the same. Each individual that comes to Arden Wood has brought unique qualities and unique interests with them. Some have their full-time practice of Christian science. Others volunteer around town, like at the airport USO, or the uh, San Francisco Airport Reading Room, or the women's prison. All over, you'll find Christian scientists from Arden Wood spreading joy. What would you bring? We have the perfect opportunity for you to come and see what is here at Arden Wood this fall. You saw the dates on the screen in October and November, even November dates are right over Thanksgiving, so please join us. Come and see what the residences have, residents have already found. And although we focused on the residences themselves, we also have a lovely sheltered care program here where you can get light support until healing is complete and you can join our residential program, Independent Living, or return to your own home, but we do have that sheltered care community. We welcome all of you to Arden Wood to soar and sing. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. You've been hearing wonderful highlights about some of our services today. And two points stand out. I'm struck yet again by the team of players that keep Ardenwood thriving. They are steadfast workers whose aim is to serve God, their leader, and mankind. And it shows, and it makes all the difference. I'm equally struck by the commitment to growing as Christian scientists, as healers in our world today. I read all of the surveys returned by patients, their families, and their Christian science practitioners. And the depth of gratitude for Arden Wood includes everyone, our staff, our residents, our patients, and you, our donors and friends. In preparing for this meeting, I realized that my own association with Arden Wood now spans 20 years this spring. I left for six of those years and returned at the end of 2010. And I've been a patient here twice. Our individual stories about Arden, our Ardenwood experiences attest to the heart of this organization. I urge you to share your story with others. I urge um, maybe at the reception uh, after this meeting to discover the variety of ways Ardenwood has touched so many lives over generations. Let me share a few very brief stories of three residents. Evie grew up nearby Saint, in, in, in nearby St. Francis Wood on the other side of West Portal Avenue and Portola Drive. She and her family were part of Arden Wood's early history. Grace first visited Arden Wood as a young girl during the Great Depression. And in subsequent years, she came here with her mother from Southern California when they took road trips to and through the Bay Area. Arden Wood is now her family. Dwight first, finished, first visited here when he was a young lad of just eight. After a long and successful career, he has now made Ardenwood his home. We've been here, we are here now, we will be here for generations to come. We've also been reminded today of the blessings of the Christian Science Nursing Ministry. Ardenwood has been a refuge for 88 years. 
a large number of Christian science nurses throughout the country are reaching retirement. We need Christian science nurses to carry on the work and they need good training. As Adam Dickey, Mary Baker Eddy's private secretary recalls, Mrs. Eddy knew that quote, patients under Christian science treatment were at times placed in a position where they needed the care and attention of a skillfully trained person who was also a Christian scientist, end quote. This is precisely why we offer the Christian Science Nursing Arts Program. In March, I was privileged to attend the graduation of three Christian Science nurses, Rose, Fiona, and Elise. It was a real highlight, and I hope you get a chance to attend a graduation at some point. Your financial and metaphysical support will help us attract and retain Christian Science nurses, giving them a rich training experience, and in turn enriches our it enriches, which in turn rich, enriches our own healing experience as nursing patients. I'm delighted to announce that a branch church here in California has gifted Ardenwood $150,000 to support Christian science nursing and training through a matching opportunity. Donations received between now and the July 31st will be matched dollar for dollar. Our goal is to raise a total of $300,000 by August 1st. Your gifts are an investment in our collective future, ensuring that others will have access to Christian science nursing care in the home, here at Ardenwood, and elsewhere in the field. Thank you for taking advantage of this well-timed matching opportunity. Over the past year, I've thought deeply about Ardenwood's vital role in the community, and I'm privileged to witness the outpouring of generosity from all corners of our large Ardenwood family. Speaking on behalf of the trustees, as well as myself, I want to express how much we appreciate everything you do from your hearts to brighten the pathway to healing, to enable us to sponsor excellent, inspiring speakers and events, and to keep the lights on 24 seven for nearly 90 years. I am very grateful to report that operational efficiencies and higher levels of utilization have put us on a fin solid financial ground and path, and we're confident that we can stay there with your continued financial and metaphysical support. The trustees consider their job of fiscal stewardship to be a clarion call to demonstrate what our leader expected, wisdom, economy, and brotherly love. These are key components of Arden Wood's uninterrupted operation and its commitment to the future. Looking ahead, we will continue to advance as a place of productive, inspired living and healing and we will remain debt-free and continue to build and strengthen our financial foundation. We also plan to reach out more widely to our field to share the good news about this vibrant community and about the care that's available here to all dedicated students of Christian science. Most of all, we wanna be a, better, a bigger blessing this year to witness more healing and more living without limitation. Thanks to each and to all for standing with us. Thank you. Let's sing another hymn, shall we? It's hymn 457 in your new hymnal. All three of you know, all three of the hymns as you notice are in the new hymnal this time. It's cause me to hear, cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning. Teach me to do your will, O God. Marcella.
Let's, con let's continue in that pathway, shall we? I'd like to introduce our speaker this afternoon. Mark Unger loved Christian science from the start. As a very young child in the Christian Science Sunday School in Spokane, Washington. What Jesus said about seeking first the kingdom of God and having everything added to you made perfect sense to him. He made that his life motto as early as high school. So in his late teens, he went on a motorcycle trip around the country for a year with enough money to last three weeks. Remember, he's in high school. <laughs> and a plan to follow God's leading and to flourish, not just survive. What he loved most was the journey walking with God and trusting him with everything. It was a remarkable year of proof beyond doubt. And so Mark fully committed his life to sharing this God with others. The first step was getting involved with church. Over the years, Mark has served in almost every capacity, including first reader and longtime Sunday school teacher. Mark went into the public practice of Christian science in 1978 setting up his office in downtown Spokane. About 10 years later, he began working for the Mother Church in Boston, which he did for many years, among other things, serving as producer, director, and host of TV, radio, and audio subscription Bible lessons and an, organize, an organizer of large youth meetings for annual meetings in Boston and Berlin, Germany. Mark became journalisted in 2003 devoting full time to his healing practice. He has also been a contributor to the Christian Science Periodicals, a member of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship, a substitute reader at the Mother Church, and Sunday School Superintendent at the Mother Church. Mark and his wife, Valerie, live in Ashland, Massachusetts, just west of Boston. And Mark's Aunt Dorothy was a much loved Ardenwood resident here for many years. Please join me now in warmly welcoming Mark Unger. Well, thank you, John, for that gracious introduction. And, uh, you know, it's been great working with John leading up to this meeting. I have to say, and as busy as he is, he has really taken care of me, made me feel welcome, shown me around, made sure I have had everything I need. So I just so appreciate that. And, you know, I've been here for a few days now. It's my first time here. And um, so I get to see, I've been able to see firsthand um, the, the stunning beauty of this place and to feel the peace and quietness and uh, love that surrounded my dear Auntie Dot, who was here for many, many years. So it's quite something. And I will say it's, it's a privilege for me to be here at your uh, special annual meeting. Thanks for having me. So as I was praying about this, it occurred to me to talk today about a principle that brings more fruit to our individual lives and to the work at an institution like Ardenwood here. 
And I think it's safe to say that all of us here and everyone else in the world for that matter, wants basically the same thing. We all want to be happy, healthy, satisfied, fulfilled. We all want to walk this earth with a sense of strength and dominion and freedom from any form of tyranny, whether it's illness or stress or depression, feeling limited or not worthy, or anything that would make us feel afraid, weak, or vulnerable. And I think we all know that Christ Jesus, more than any man, taught us how to be free, really free. How to be strong against the storms of life and maintain a deep sense of joy and dominion in this life. In this life, this experience, here and now. You know, right out of the starting gate, right at the very beginning of his three-year ministry that changed the world forever, his first words, according to the Gospels, were to announce that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right here, right now. And he added one key word, a verb, to this announcement, repent. As it says in Matthew 4, verse 17, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, the Greek word for repent, metaneo, means in part to change one's mind for the better, according to Strong's Concordance of the Bible. So, in order to see and experience this kingdom right at hand here today, we need to think differently than the world would have us think. And it occurred to me that the rest of his ministry was showing us that the kingdom is, in fact, here and now. And he taught how to change our minds for the better so we can see and experience it. He made, it ev he made evident this kingdom of harmony, didn't he, by healing every illness and disease, casting out sin and evil, raising the dead, feeding the multitude, stilling the storms, showing the unlimited, impartial, and merciful love of God for his children at every turn. And we have a compact and wide-ranging teaching in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount for how to think differently for the better, which is to repent. And most of us here, I'm sure, are very familiar with what Mary Baker Eddy, who discovered and explained the science of what Jesus taught, wrote about the teachings of the, in the Sermon on the Mount, which is Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. In her message to the Mother Church for 1901, she wrote, To my sense, the Sermon on the Mount, read each Sunday without comment and obeyed throughout the week, would be enough for Christian practice. Read and obeyed. Now that's very similar to what Jesus himself said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, if we hear his sayings and do them, we would be like one who builds on the rock. And when the storms of life come, we will stand strong with dominion, not be knocked down, to use my own paraphrase. I have seen in my own lifetime positive proof over and over again that to the degree we think and live the way Jesus taught us to think and live, we do see and experience this kingdom of heaven, harmony at hand. And in this realization, there's a great sense of deep joy and dominion and strength, even in times of weakness or struggle. There's a sense of permanent happiness, health, fulfillment, peace, and freedom, deep-seated. And, you know, who does not want more of that? And this goes along with what Jesus said in John about why he came. These things I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He also said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, one instruction <clears throat> that I would like to focus on today about how to think differently for the better is the last half of chapter 6 in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount 
where Jesus instructs us not to think about our lives. <laughs> not to think about our lives. And furthermore, not to think about our bodies. <laughs> That's pretty radical instruction, not to think about our lives and our bodies, because isn't that all we tend to think about? It's our lives and our body. Well, he's clearly introducing a necessary paradigm shift, a major change in the way we need to think to experience this kingdom at hand. And he tells us why we don't need to think about our lives or body, reminding us of birds and flowers that are taken care of by our Heavenly Father. And he even makes the point that by taking thought, we can't make ourselves any taller, for example. So he infers the question, then why do you think about your lives? But he doesn't, of course, leave us hanging. He tells us what we should be thinking about instead. The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And when we do this, all the things we need for our lives and our bodies, which would include, of course, health and happiness and supply of everything good, will be given to us. Assuring us that our Father knows our needs even before we ask. Now, can we trust this? Will we really be taken care of? Is this a rock we can truly build and stand on? You know, I remember vividly in my early teens as I was walking down the street, this scripture about taking no thought for your life, but only seeking God and his righteousness came to thought. And I decided right then and there to follow that instruction in my life. And as John mentioned in the intro, I made it a motto for my life. And I did have some wonderful experiences during those school years and after with this as my goal. And I'd like to share a very simple example from those early years that I think illustrates simply and clearly this principle of building on the rock and how it can work. I had recently graduated from high school and I was sitting out on the curb in the front of our house, just thinking about things. And it occurred to me very clearly that it was time to move out of my parents' house and the reason why. And it was a reason that was really important to me. I had a clear sense that living at home would only hold me back in my spiritual growth at that point. However, it wasn't at all clear how I could accomplish this financially. Long story short, uh, I sat there praying and wrestling with different ideas until one came that made the most sense, and I felt peace. It occurred to me to buy a house for myself. Now, it didn't take much money to buy a house in those days. If you could find one that needed work, you could buy it inexpensively with little money down, have a personal contract with the owner and small house payments. I, in fact, already owned a rental house and a four unit apartment building that I bought that way with money I saved from my paper routes and part time job I had in high school. OK, seek ye first the kingdom of God. <laughs> The purchase of these were ideas that came to me from God during high school that I followed through on, which I felt was a result of following Jesus' instruction to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All my friends were spending their money on other things, but this is what I felt God was leading me to do. So through my prayer that day, I now had a plan from God, clear direction and the authority and confidence that goes with it. And of course, we could plug any decision one arrives at through prayer into this scenario. It could be a decision to take a job, join a church, enter into a relationship, start a business, come work here at Arden Wood, or live here, or even decide to come here for healing. Now, some may ask, but how do you know that it's God's plan? And I think that's an important question because this is now the rock that I'm going to be standing on through the process. The fact that this is God's plan, and I'm going to be trusting that he is in control. 
I think there are different ways to figure out if it's really God's plan, depending on the situation. But in this case, I was pretty clear because the whole thing developed within my thought in a very short time, sitting there on the curb, and it wasn't anything I was even considering. I also knew I had a deep desire in my heart to follow God's lead because I felt like he always would have the best plan for me. And I think if that's what's in our heart, we're always safe. Safe, that is, from self-inflicted turmoil, like what Jonah put himself through in this week's Bible lesson. And if this weren't God's plan, then it ultimately wouldn't work out, and new thoughts and ideas would come along the way. Plus, we all know that when we pray, it's not an intellectual exercise. We feel something, and I felt something. So now I have a solid rock to stand on through the whole experience, especially if things get rough or challenging or trying. I can go into this trusting God and not be swayed by circumstances or events or people, no matter how challenging. And isn't this the basis or principle by which Jesus operated? Didn't he take to heart his own words and build on the rock himself? not thinking about his own life, but seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, righteousness, and consequently not swayed by people or circumstances or events, as challenging as his journey became. He said point blank, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. He trusted his all, even his very life to God and was willing to lay it all down for God and for us. No small thing, of course. And I'm sure we all feel that we can't remember what he did for us and be grateful for it often enough. And if we look at Mrs. Eddy's experience, she too clearly was building on the rock, not thinking about her life, but seeking God's will, and was consequently able to withstand the many severe storms that came to knock her and her work down along the way in her discovery and founding of Christian science. Now, for me, in this simple example, the biggest challenge that came up was that we would find a house, go look at it, and I would picture myself in it, thinking it's just what I needed, the right price, only to find out it was sold. I was tempted to be disappointed. See, the thing is, these types of houses I was looking for sold like hotcakes. They often sold even before they hit the market. So finding one I knew could be tricky. But again, this was God's idea. That's where the peace and dominion comes into play. I could keep going back to the fact that I was seek seeking God's will. And this was his idea, not mine. That really is a heavenly rock. Well, the first time this happened, where I looked at a house ready to buy, found out it was sold, I very quickly thought about the fact that God was in control and had something better for me. That was not my house, I reasoned, and I didn't need to be disappointed. It was clearly someone else's house, and there would be something even better for me. Although that can be hard to imagine sometimes when we have our heart set on something. Well, the same thing happened two more times, looking at houses that someone else bought. And I had the same thought pro process. In fact, I was getting stronger in my trust. I knew each time there had to be something better for me. And God knew what that was. So I was able to be patient and keep my joy about this, truly trusting that God had my best interests in mind. Well, many weeks went by after this, and one day, possibly with a hint of impatience, I picked up the Sunday paper and I threw it down in front of my older brother, who was a realtor and was helping me with this, and said, find me a house. Now, I think it was a God-impelled moment because I remember exactly the scene to this day. So my brother started looking through the paper, called on a house, got an answering machine. And to make a long story short here too, 
in what seemed like a miraculous way, we were able to view and buy the house before it was sold, even though the realtor had received over 50 calls on the house that day. Now, this house was far better for me than anything I had seen in every way. The woman who had been living there just walked out one day, and she was now being taken care of in an institution of some kind. I bought the house with everything in it, and I mean everything, right down to the Kleenex. Think about what, what would be in your house if you just walked out. Everything, literally everything, from bath towels to dishes to furniture and so forth. There was even food in the cupboard. I had a brand new washer and dryer, and I ate during those years I lived there off of nice china dishes. I could never have imagined something like this happening. Well, those early years of seeking God's will and trusting were only the beginning of a lifelong journey of learning what it means to build on the rock. As my faith and trust increased through experience, so did the life-changing leadings and demands. And it has actually all been good. In fact, great. Now, so I don't come across here as sounding like <clears throat> Mr. Perfect. I can tell you that there have been times where I have interjected my will, my desires, my limitations, or even my fears. And what I have found is hopeful. It seems that if deep down we want to do what is right, what is God's will, and yet we are interjecting our own will, God will still lead us and bless us even more by exposing and destroying any sin and thought that's trying to get in the way of his blessed plan for us. You know, science and health makes it clear that Paul in the Bible was blessed in this way. In an explanation of Saul's conversion to Paul, Mrs. Eddy writes in part that his uncertain sense of right yielded to a spiritual sense, which is always right. He learned the wrong that he had done in persecuting Christians whose religion he had not understood. And in humility, he took the new name of Paul. He beheld for the first time the true idea of love and learned a lesson in divine science. We can trust our lives to divine love. When Paul came up against challenges, bonds and afflictions, as he called them, he said, but none of these things move me. And he also said, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, there's no doubt that God is calling the workers that need to be here at Ardenwood. And that is a heavenly and strengthening rock to stand on. You know, if I were called to work here, I couldn't help but be aware of certain foundational truths. I would want to keep myself aware of why Ardenwood is here and what it represents at this moment in the world. It's really not just any institution, it seems to me. It's not just a nice place to work, maybe with friendly people who think in a similar way. When we think about the healing activity going on here at Arden Wood, we can easily go back at least 2,000 years ago to the birth and ministry of Christ Jesus, back to the fulfillment of the most important prophecy in the world, the coming of the promised Messiah for the salvation of mankind. Now, these are not just nice words for Ardenwood. This is really true. Of course, we know that anything good in this world is God-ordained, God-supported. But the healing activity here has a special place in the fulfillment of prophecy. And that, to me, is not something to take lightly. The constant realization of this is a rock to build on and stand on, especially when the going gets tough. 
If we think about it, Arden Wood, with its focus on spiritual healing according to Christ Jesus' method and command, would not be here as an institution it is right now if Jesus had never lived, if the promised Messiah had never come, if the virgin birth had never taken place. It wouldn't be here, would it? The whole prophecy, birth, and ministry of Christ Jesus was ordained of God for the saving of the world. And we know that Jesus then prophesied the coming of the Comforter, which would explain his teaching and thus further saving of the world. And we know this Comforter came through Mary Baker Eddy and her discovery of Christian science. As she says in Science and Health, quote, in the words of St. John, he shall give you another Comforter that he may abide with you forever. This Comforter I understand to be divine science. Now we know that Mrs. Eddy not only discovered, but founded Christian science. She was clearly directed by God to establish the many activities of the Church of Christ scientists outlined in the church manual. And Mrs. Eddy made it clear that it was, not, that it was the power of God that impelled her to write the church manual. She wrote specifically in regard to the rules and bylaws saying that, quote, they were impelled by a power not one's own. Now, to me, that means that the activities of the manual, wherever being lived and supported, have the full support and backing of the Almighty God. And that, to me, is a rock to stand on. It translates to mean that if we are living in any way in support of those activities, we have welcomed in the power and presence and strength and comfort and safety, and goodness, and happiness, and dominion of God into our lives. That is helpful to keep in mind, so that we can continue in our work with the unwavering assurance that God is with us, no matter what trials come our way, no matter what resistance we face. And sometimes we need that assurance, especially when we are doing God's work seeking his righteousness in this world that would oppose that. Now, the text in the Sermon on the Mount that we've been talking about, the last half of Matthew chapter 6, applies specifically to physical healing as well. I thought we might just consider that briefly. In Christian science healing, we prayerfully get the focus off our life a limited sense of life that feels separate from God, and also turn away from the body. And do what? We seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his rightness, the rightness or correctness of perfect God, perfect man. For healing, don't we get thought stayed on the one all harmonious life and ourselves as natural, healthy expressions of that life? In this same section of Matthew 6, Jesus instructs that if our eye is single, our whole body will be full of light. We must keep our eye single to the light of spirit and away from matter. And Jesus told us not to think about our lives and our body. And Mrs. Eddy, interestingly enough, tells us what to expect if we do think about our bodies, and how to remedy that mistake. She writes in Science and Health, if we look to the body for pleasure, we find pain. For life, we find death. For truth, we find error. For spirit, we find its opposite matter. Now reverse this action, look away from the body into truth and love, the principle of all happiness, harmony, and immortality. And wouldn't that be the kingdom of God and his righteousness? And she continues, hold thoughts steadfastly to the enduring, the good, and the true, and you will bring these into your experience proportionably to their occupancy of your thoughts. So this is a way of changing thought for the better in regard to health as well. 
But let's go back to this bigger picture again. Did God set this all in motion? The prophecy of the Messiah, the fulfillment of the prophecy in the birth and ministry of Christ Jesus, the prophecy and coming of the Comforter, the fulfilling of that prophecy in the revelation of divine science through Mary Baker Eddy, along with the establishment of the activities to further this revealed truth to the world, and then just leave it to us to work it all out? No, of course not. God is with us every step of the way. You see the rock that we can build on and stand on? Everyone here has the full support of the all-loving, all-powerful God right here, right now, bringing about the fulfillment of prophecy and the salvation of mankind. Think of what this active awareness does for those who come here in need of comfort and healing. It causes everyone to lean on, depend on, trust in God, which is where the healing comes from. Those that come here have all the power on earth and in heaven, the full power of God and his healing Christ behind them for transformation and healing. The power of God is in this work and is a solid rock. You know, I was thinking, this is a humble little facility nestled in the trees here in San Francisco. But the work being done here brings light into the world. And remember Jesus himself was born in a barn, surrounded by farm animals and grew up in an obscure little village of Nazareth. And yet he changed the world. And how many dedicated students did he have? Not many. It seems important not to lose sight of what is going on here and what you are doing here. You are changing and saving the world. You are fulfilling prophecy. You are strengthened, upheld, supported, enlightened by your Father in your day-to-day -day work. You are never alone. No matter what seems to be going on here, the truth is God is in control, and you can trust that with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Whatever the demands are, whatever changes need to be made at any time, God is here leading you on. The rock is to remember this is God's work. This is God's plan. We don't need to think about our lives. All we need to think about is God and his righteousness and listen for his guidance and direction and support and angel messages at every step. God takes care of our lives and makes them happy and healthy and bountiful. You know, even those living here have a privileged role to play in support of the healing activity going on. If I were living here, I hope I would remember that every thought I think, even in the privacy of my own home, could make a difference in the healing that takes place here. As employees and workers in all the day-to-day -day work here and human interactions, dealing with all the issues that come up constantly. I know how easy it can be to forget the bigger picture and why you are here and how important this is and how God is ordaining this activity and how supported you are of God because of the work and mission. You know, I love the inspiring and no-nonsense address given by Mr. Marvin Randolph Higgins on the eve of the opening here of this facility so many years ago, who apparently had so much to do with the origin of this facility. He said, quote, you are part of a vast spiritual movement that is revolutionizing the religious thought of the world. You are engaged in the greatest work in the world, healing the sick, comforting the distressed, giving the thirsty the cup of cold water, he also said, you are here for a definite purpose, a sublime purpose. 
And I love that he used the word sublime to describe your purpose. That would be an exalted purpose, noble, awe-inspiring, glorious, wonderful, fabulous, heavenly, out, divine, out of this world. And he was, of course, right. And on an individual basis, this work is between you and God. It is really God, isn't it, that places each one of us and continues to direct our way. Based on my experience, I have found that we can be the best workers, the best employees, by putting God first, by thinking of him or her as our supervisor or boss, first and foremost. Putting God first in everything in our lives is always the best approach. This is seeking his righteousness. We are most effective when we are about our father's business, under the direction and supervision of God, divine love. That is our rock. Mrs. Eddy tells us in miscellaneous writings, each student should seek alone the guidance of our common father, even the divine principle, which he claims to demonstrate. It doesn't matter what other people think or do or even say about you or others. It only matters what you think and do and say. Putting God first puts us in right relationship with others. And I have found this to be true even as in something as close as a marriage relationship, putting God first. If you think about it, Jesus was not concerned with what others thought or did, was he? He was just obedient and loved because of his secure relationship with the Father. This was his rock, why he wasn't moved. He was even silent against false accusations at his trial. And I have always loved his open secret that he shared with us when he said, he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. And certainly, Jesus' oneness with the Father is the same as our oneness with the Father. We are equally God's children, equally loved, equally protected and cared for and comforted. That was his message. The same Father that sent us has not left us alone ever. And I've found this to be a key in healing. And we can stand on this rock of truth. For I do always those things that please him, Jesus said. He was in the God-pleasing business, wasn't he? Not the people-pleasing business. That's because he knew he was employed by God. We too can strive to please God. This allows us to have the purest love, which brings healing. This brings the biggest blessing to those around us, those we are helping and those we work for. This is the most loving and supportive thing that we can do for others. This is a way to follow the two great commandments to love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. Which Mrs. Eddy says, by the way, is the rock on which Christian science is built, the two great commandments. You know, when I worked for the Mother Church, which I did for many years, I always thought about why I was there at any given point and reminded myself often that I was there at God's bidding. I was always ready to leave or stay, depending on what God wanted. And there were definitely times when I felt ready to leave, and God said, stay, because I apparently had more to give and definitely had more to learn. But I was serving him first, and out of that came the best service I could give, in serving the cause of Christian science 
serving others, those that I worked with, as well as the world. Putting God first was definitely my rock. Now, I'd like to wrap this up by sharing two of many experiences I had while working at the Mother Church as examples of putting these ideas into practice, seeking God and his righteousness, and thinking less about my own life and being able to trust that. Now, these experiences happened many years ago, um, 20, 25 years ago, which is to say there's probably a handful of people at the church that were there when, the, when this all happened. In one experience, I was going, going to have a performance review. And I knew it was going to be a bad review. And in my mind, very unjustly so. And it would take too long to explain it all. But briefly, I had been bounced around from boss to boss, department to department, because the job I was doing was so unique, although extremely important to meet many important commitments the church had. Also, things were in a big transition at that point, and nobody was sure where the activity belonged. Well, because of the uniqueness of what I was doing, others did not understand what it took to do the job. And I was doing a lot for one person, mostly unsupported, except by God, of course. I knew this boss, who was a fairly new boss of mine, thought I should be doing some administrative things that were not important to getting my job done. And I was giving this work all that I had. So my first thought was I was going to be prepared to fight this during the performance review and then take my case to the personnel department, explaining how unreasonable and unfair it all was. And of course, let them know what an amazing job I was doing. My second thought was that I could use this opportunity to attempt to be more like Jesus and truly not think about myself, not be concerned about my life, but give my all to God, who was my real and only boss and who knew what I was doing and would continue to reward me accordingly. Could I trust my life to God in this way? At the time, I felt that attempting to go down that road would be nearly impossible for me. How could I be that humble and not react to what was about to be a very unjust sentence that could easily be explained away, or so I thought. So I decided to take this on and use this as an opportunity to grow, really go for it. I knew that the only way I could succeed would be to really feel God to be completely governed by God, to have like the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon me. I prayed fervently to shift my thinking off myself to God in his righteousness. I reminded myself why I was there, who put me there, and that I was working for God. And God knew and appreciated me, and that was enough. I also knew clearly that my compensation was determined by God and not by people. I knew I didn't need to stand up for myself. I didn't need to fight for anything. I could just give my life to God and let God take care of me. Well, what happened absolutely amazed me. I did feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost in the room that day. I couldn't believe how peaceful I was during that performance review. And it was a bad review. I was attacked personally and professionally. And it didn't bother me at all. I didn't try to defend myself. No need. I was at peace and felt divine love present. I felt no resentment or animosity. Was able to love this other person. I was not taking offense. I listened to the concerns expressed and with a calm and an amazing detachment from it all. I even surprised myself by writing on the review that I was going to try to do better in light of the concerns expressed. And I was mostly sincere. 
Well, I will never forget that peaceful feeling I had that day. Not only did I get a very unjust and bad review for my file, I was punished by not getting any merit increase in my pay for that year that everybody gets. But for me, that was a small price to pay for what was a complete and utter victory. I had overcome myself, my mortal sense of self, even if only for a time. However, I think we all know that experiences like that never leave us where they found us. I know I was changed forever. I was standing solid on the rock and was sustained. I knew and God knew all that I was doing for the cause and the world in my work that no one at the time clearly understood and it didn't matter. And oh, uh, by the way, Within the year, I was moved to a new department that completely understood all that I was doing, completely supported me, and was so impressed by all that I was accomplishing on me, my own, they gave me like a $10,000 raise, which was over 10 times more than I would have gotten with a merit increase. We can trust our Father, Mother, God to take care of us in any situation. Well, another time I was asked to work on a very intense and important project that would last about six to eight months. I turned it down because it had taken me months to recover from doing a similar project the previous year, and I was just getting over it. I didn't feel I could go through that again, what I had gone through before. The way it had been managed, it seemed to cause a lot of unnecessary work to be done on my end, meaning many late nights and working weekends for months at a time. I was asked a few times if I would please consider working on this project. I finally said I would if I could get some agreement on how things would be done. The person that hired me for this agreed to my terms, but I found within a few weeks that the same things were happening all over again, and my demands had somehow been lost in the shuffle. I became so upset one Friday night after working very, very late, and I could see the writing on the wall. I told God I couldn't do this, and I would be quitting on Monday. Knowing what was going to happen with this project, it just made no sense to me that I should have to go through this again. I was, I, I was very, very upset, maybe a bit angry with myself for agreeing to do this. Well, I remember on the way to the train to go home late that night, I told God that the only thing I could see to do was to quit. So that if he had something else in mind, he would have to make it really clear. But I just couldn't imagine this job was for me to do. But you see, I really did have deep down a desire to do what God thought best, even though I felt there was really only one option. So I'm sitting on the train in a state of frustration with my mind racing. And through it all, I heard God say to me, do you really think the church is being governed by many minds? Well, do you know what a slap upside the head feels like? <clears throat> or a gut punch? That's what this was like. Um, but it was an angel message that changed everything as I thought about it. Such a simple concept that I completely missed. One mind governing the church. Was I willing to put my money where my mouth was, I asked myself. This is a concept that we throw around all the time, right? There's only one mind. But are we willing to live it, to make it practical? This was very humbling and was my opportunity to live and hold to what I knew to be true. Now, what's great about God's messages to us is that they are not just, as I alluded to before, intellectual thoughts that come to us, but a transforming power. As I thought and prayed about this message and calmed down and humbled myself, I felt transformed. I was actually excited to go back 
to work on this project the next week. I had a whole new job description from God. I knew I had a higher purpose for being there. And that was to constantly know at every turn that there was one mind governing. And I felt this project needed someone knowing that. Every hint at many minds needed to be put down with this simple but powerful truth. The actual work I needed to accomplish now seemed secondary to this task. It was one of the best experiences of my life. I wouldn't have traded it for the world. Now, I'm not sure that things necessarily changed all that much as far as management and the late nights and weekends, but I had a completely different outlook and wasn't focusing on mismanagement or mistakes, but doing everything I could to support the activity, holding to the fact that there was one mind, no matter what presented itself. I was on the rock. I forgot about my life in connection with truth, with the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and was richly rewarded, as I've seen happen so many times. The kingdom of God truly is at hand. We can repent, change the way we think for the better, by forgetting about our lives and our bodies, and giving our all to God and his will for us. This is our solid rock of happiness and health and freedom and dominion and heaven on earth. Thank you. And our final hymn is 533, which I'm going to introduce. And I'm going to introduce it by reading the second verse. That's 533. What though my human comforts die, the Lord my Savior liveth. What though the darkness gather round, songs in the night God giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is God of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? Okay, 533.
Thank you all for coming. We'll see you at the reception.